Good evening. Good evening. Um, welcome good evening. to okay, good evening and welcome to Bible study. Um glad you join us. Um we have with us Reverend Artis, and we're gonna ask him to pray first, and then we'll get ready for Bible school, okay? Yes, Thank you. Okay, okay. amen. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I pray that you had a wonderful day and that throughout this week, uh, you were remembering what we shared on Sunday, uh, that you were taking a moment just to pause and to see the importance of this holy week. Uh, before we go any further into our Bible study, again, I want to thank you all for allowing me to share with you on Sunday. Uh, and it is my hope and prayer that tonight's lesson will be informative and that it will be transformative for you and your, your uh, church family. Let's go to God in prayer though. Gracious Father, again, we pause just to say thank you. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to be here, even on this digital platform. We know, God, that we could have been anywhere. We could have been doing anything at this time, but we took it as an opportunity of growth uh, that you may grace us with your presence. So, Lord God, be with us in this time of study as well as this time of just sharing so that you, Lord God, would get the glory out of everything that we do, thing that we say on this evening. I thank you, God, for uh, these, your people who are here. And I ask, Lord God, that this time would be informative and give them what they need to go on and just to see what the end is going to be. So, Lord God, bless this time as our prayer for us in the mighty name of Jesus that we do pray and ask it all. Amen. 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 Well, Amen. let me see. We got 15 people online. Uh, Deacon Miss Parker, if you still have that ability, you can share that okay, uh, access with me so I can share my screen. Okay, let's see. All right. Did it come up? Are you no. okay? No. No, okay. It, it did not. Deacon Diedrich? Diedrich. Yes. I'm on. Um, I'll, I'll reach out to Leon real quick. You got it. There it is. Hey, I got, got it. it. I got it. Yeah. I got okay. it. Perfect. All right. All right. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. It, that's right. I love okay. it. I love it. Teamwork. That's right. Thank you. We're gonna make this work together, okay? All right, y'all give me a second just to make my screen more user-friendly. All right, there we go. So for those who just joined us, um, if you were not with me last time, we're coming from a book called The Practices of... Um, Passionate Worship. Um, well, excuse me, that is the chapter that we're in on tonight. It's actually the uh, Growing Congregation. Um, and I can send you a picture of it um, uh, after, after Bible study. I can share that with you uh, to give you the exact title and author if you want to pick up a copy of it. But uh, on last night, well, last time we were together, uh, we talked about the fruitfulness of a congregation uh, and what it takes to be a growing church uh, in this day and age. Uh, tonight, we want to look at the practices of passionate worship. And I believe that God uh, uses our worship on a regular basis on Sundays or anytime we have uh, Sunday or uh, worship, uh, excuse me, weekly worship. Uh, God uses that time to strengthen us, to encourage us but also to equip us uh, so that we can go out into this world uh, where we work, where we live, and to share with other people the testimony that we have, uh, as well as to give the encouragement that we receive while we're in worship. Uh, worship is not a spectator, spectator sport, uh, but it is a act of reverence. Uh, it go, it, for me, worship is very... Um, it, it's planned out. It's thought through. Uh, it's not something that just happens by, by happenstance. You don't just happen to stumble upon uh, a good time of worship, but it's intentional. 
um, and and we don't uh, we allow the Holy Spirit to utilize what we have planned and what we have put together uh, so that the experience overall is influenced. Um, we don't just lean on the Holy Spirit to do all the work, uh, no, but rather we do our part so that the Holy Spirit can fill in and enhance what we've already done. Um, so I hope you're taking notes. And at any point, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to chime in. Uh, when I do in-person Bible study, it's a little bit more interactive because I'm moving around. I get to, to see who I'm talking to. Uh, virtual is still good. Um, but if you using your hand emojis or anything like that to raise your hand, I'll see those as well. Turn with me in your Bible, and you don't have to turn, but it, it, it will be good to just know or reference this scripture right here, Luke, the 10th chapter, 27th verse. Uh, and this is one of those Bible verses that I learned when I was a kid. Say, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. Uh, and with your mind, and with your mind, I'm going to say that one more time, and with your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and the reason that I keep emphasizing that with your mind part uh, or section within that verse is because oftentimes we leave our mind at home for some reason when we come to church. Um, we, we come with our heart, we come with our soul, we come with our strength. Uh, to be sure. But for some reason, we don't often consider that my mind is a part of this worship experience um, uh, unless we get to a part that invokes our emotions. You know, when the preacher says, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, um, and we have an emotional response. Uh, but if you actually think of that part or think of or you consider what is being said, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, um, and all that he has done for me, my soul then responds as an emotional response to what my mind already cultivated, what my brain said is right, which is true. Uh, and that is God has indeed done whatever it is that you're expressing. Um, so it's important that when you first come to, to, to worship, don't leave your mind at home. Bring your mind with you. Um, because the experience is far greater when you are in tune, not just with your emotions and with your senses, but also you are partnering all of that together with your mind and you are focused, you are mindful of the space that you're in, as well as what you are interpreting. For me, there is something powerful about worship, um, where all pretenses are, are peeled away. Um, people speak, they pray, they sing together, and then they're not concerned about what other people think about them. Everything just naturally flows from the heart. Uh, and, and the reason that we do this, this, this corporate worship, is because God manifests God's self in the presence of God's people. Scripture declares where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst. And that is very important to know that, yes, I can worship by myself. I can have an encounter and an experience with God uh, when I'm, I'm in my devotional time, but it is just something about when we all get together. Of course, we have a good time. We hear good singing. We hear good preaching. Uh, but it is something about the spirit moving amongst the people where you can feel it, you can, you can sense it, you can imagine it, you can just have an overall just experience of God in one place all together. In fact, when the disciples were all together in the upper room, days after Jesus had been crucified, had been had risen from the dead. Uh, and he was walking amongst the people, as the Bible says. They were in this upper room together, and they were trying to figure out what in the world is going on. They got all of the religious leaders still looking for them, so they're scared out of their lives. Um, the, the people that were following Jesus don't know what happened. It's, it's just ca utter chaos going on. Uh, and then also for themselves individually, they're looking at the group, and they're saying, we lost some folks. One of them was a one of them turned Jesus over uh, for some for some cheap silver. 
another person denied Jesus. So the core group is not the same. We're all in disarray. We don't know what we're going to do. And that's when the Holy Spirit rushed in like a mighty wind, as Acts says to us, and introduces to us the formal church or the Christian church. So worship outpours throughout the, the upper room that they're in, and they start to speak a, a, a foreign language. And, and it says that the fire rested upon their tongues, and they were able to hear each other in another language, as it says. That is the experience that we want to have in church. Not necessarily the speaking of tongues, or, or as we call the glossolalia experience. Not necessarily that, but we want to be at a place where we can bring everyone who is disheartened, dis, who is disorganized, or, or a concerned, or who has fears or anxiety, where you can bring all those folk together and allow the Lord to do what the Lord needs to do at one time, rush through like a mighty wind, bring us all on one accord, allow us to feel your presence. Also, understand different languages, understand what we have been confused about before. Those are the type of worship experiences that we need uh, in, in any church, any church. So we look afresh at the worship services, at, uh, uh, looking afresh, excuse me, at the worship service of your church um, that we currently offer. How could we deepen our worship life to make our services more authentic, compelling, and life-changing? Now, for those who have not been with me or on Bible study before, I ask questions. I'm an interactive type of teacher. Um, I, I do not prefer that I just sit here and, and talk for an hour, but I want your feedback because it helps us in the learning time, okay? So those those that question right there, I'm gonna pose that. We're gonna take a pause and get some feedback. How could we deepen our worship life to make our services more authentic, compelling, and life-changing. I'm going to give you an example, just in case you're a little confused about the question. What area of the worship experience do you think we need to kind of lean into more? Do we have enough prayer? Do we have enough singing? Is there enough time for us to fellowship with one another? Are we uh, in and out too quickly? Are we staying too long? Uh, and this is not to just poke or prod or to just say, hey, we need to do this at more like a, a, a logistical thing, but just to hear each other's e each other's thoughts. OK, so let me let me get somebody to give some feedback. Um, I'd like to, to ask a couple of questions and sure. one be, what is the role of testimony in a worship and 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 as you were talking about the upper room um what struck me is that they were actually communicating with each other mm -hmm. and and i think what 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 strikes me sometimes about our modern worship is that it's become a spectator sport mm -hmm. um we come to church to be entertained we come to church to make uh hear the preacher make us happy so the first thing is the testimony. Mm -hmm. And the second uh, thing would be hymns. Uh, we're getting sort of out, out of, of the traditional type of hymns and, and I'm very sensitive or, or, or just looking at how the modern church is transitioning away from hymns to more praise and worship type or is there room for everybody? You know, and so I, I'd like to pose those two to you. Okay. Sure, and I can answer those based off of my background and my experience. Uh, the testimony portion, and if you refer back to Sunday's uh, sermon, that was literally a part of the thesis, uh, is that when we have an encounter or an experience with Jesus Christ, that should, pro that should prompt and push us to go forward and share our testimonies in service, meaning in the physical building, or outside of service. At any point that you have the opportunity to share a testimony with somebody, then you should. Now, spe speaking specifically about what you're saying, when it comes to worship, service, like let's say on a Sunday morning, I do 
remember, and I, I, I did grow up having testimony service where the deacons lined the front and we had testimony service. I think it was removed from this worship service because it became elongated. It became too long uh, and it, there was no structure to it. Um, and when we're looking at worship logistics, we definitely want to have some type of structure. Um, it, it became a, a moment of, it changed from being testimony to, to being, I'm going to spill all my uh, my dirt and my drama. If I remember, <laughs> uh, if that's what I, I remember, you know, hearing some, some stories that um, I needed clarification from, from my parents later on, uh, who were both deacons. And I was like, what in the world is this? So it, because it got taken out of context, it was removed from a lot of traditional churches. Uh, but there is space for testimony. And, and, and what we've learned now in, in this day and age with technology is that testimonies are not always captured on Sunday morning uh, verbally. You know, we have the opportunity to use websites and to use technology. I, I know a church specifically that they allow you to share your testimony or prayer requests on their prayer wall, on their website. And people access this and they go on and they're praying for one another. They're also updating their testimonies and saying, hey, you know, this is what I shared you all with you all last week. Here's the update. You know, those kind of opportunities are presented to us so that we can access it on an on-demand kind of basis, if that makes sense. And then the second part of your question, hymns. I, I'm, I'm a hymn uh, buff. <laughs> I, I love um, all types of traditional hymns, anthems, and, and all of that. They have proper uh, place within the worship setting. Um, I honestly prefer to hear the hymn um, during worship in conjunction with the praise and worship as well as the um, other uh, more new age um, contemporary, that's what it's, contemporary gospel songs, you know, um, they have to have balance because you got to be able to, got to be able to, to, to give, give a little bit to everybody, you know? Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay I have a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the you spoke about being in the upper room, um, mm -hmm. in the Holy Spirit. Um, with the Holy Spirit, do you think that we need more teaching and explanation on? the part of being baptized with the Holy Spirit and just the Holy Spirit coming upon um, the, the disciples in the upper room. Does that make sense? It does. And I, you all, if you see me kind of put my head down, I'm taking notes of your questions so that I make sure mm -hmm. that I answer them directly. Um, mm -hmm. So let me just read it back. So um, you were speaking of the upper room experience. Do we need more teaching on baptism of the Holy Spirit or baptism or um, the receiving, Holy, yeah, receiving of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Um, okay. Do, in, in talking about the Holy Spirit, uh, perhaps not enough information is given. Um, you know, like in certain churches, they do certain things like running around and all that stuff. No, that's not what we need. We want to understand. We need to understand more of what the Holy Spirit and being bab the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. Does that make sense? It, it does make sense. It In does make teaching. sense. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Deacon Esparza, it does make sense. So um, what we must understand about the Holy Spirit. So the, the purpose of the Holy Spirit coming um, was to be left as a comforter. In fact, that's what Jesus says, you know, in the scripture after he ascends that I'm leaving a comforter with you um, who is not to just make us run around. Like, like you said, 
even though I believe and I've experienced that myself where I I don't know what it was, <laughs> but I can't say no, it was nothing but the Holy Spirit that made me run around like that because of the experience that I had as well as the feeling of shackles being breaking, broken, um, just the overall just release, right? Uh -huh. um, so that has its part. But going back to the original statement, about learning about the Holy Spirit, I'll be very honest with you. I have a person who I contact when I have questions about this, um, mm -hmm. but I can answer this question. Um, I think there's two trainings of thought, and we experience, we see this in the various denominations. So mm -hmm. you see more of a pop Pentecostal Reformation, holiness kind of Reformation, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. they believe that the Holy Spirit uh, is Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as well as speaking in tongues, are expressions that you are now um, saved, right? Um, yeah. Whereas uh, Protestant or Baptist belief, as we are Baptist, we believe mm -hmm. that the Holy Spirit is already given to us. It's it's already a gift of grace mm -hmm. that is extended to us without us even having to ask for it. Uh huh. So it's it's really all about what we believe and what we are taught. Um, is is there is um, there is no I, I can't pinpoint it and say there's a right or wrong way for that specifically um, because the Holy Spirit is one of those inexpressible uh, uh, um, inexpressible uh, moments um, where you you are learning. Um, about, about your, how do I say this? The Holy Spirit gives us the knowledge of understanding of how we can be holy, uh -huh. right? It, it pushes and, 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 and forces us to be uncomfortable when we about to sin. So it, uh -huh. it, it attacks various areas of our lives mentally. Um, we say something told me that I was supposed to do this. Mm -hmm. It's the Holy Spirit. Um, you feel that feeling that something's wrong. You have discernment. Well, that comes from the Holy Spirit. Um, who is this? All right. Marshall. Who is, who is uh, Marshall? Yeah. Is. Think uh, right. Marshall. Is that you? Okay. So the right. Holy Spirit yes, is our man. God to help us live a spiritual life. Yes. Yeah. That's what I was wanted us. I mean, I wanted to contribute. As you know, I've always known it as a guide, uh, which uh, helps in the direction in which, you know, how I'm going to live, you know, how I'm going to portray myself as a Christian, you know, mm -hmm. how my spiritual uh, life can reflect from what the Holy Spirit is telling me, what I should do, how I should act, how I should speak, and you know, that has been one of the, the keys, I believe. And uh, when you're talking to others, they see the example of Christ-like things in you. And they see how you have been successful and how you are living your life and how you uh, seem to be happy and at peace. And it's because of the Holy Spirit, I believe. That's right. all I want to contribute. And thank you for the contribution. All right. Think of Parker. Did we answer that question for you? Yeah, yeah. Except okay. for the part about in some in the Bible it said we have to ask for the Holy Spirit. It, I mean, we receive it in salvation, but also we have to ask for the continual filling of the Holy Spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so we, we and we know that that's an uh, that's a that's a process. That's an ongoing thing. Uh -huh. that's, that's not just one time. Yeah. And, and yeah. done. You know, it's an ongoing thing. Okay. So. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Let's let's go to this next slide. Okay. Authentic, alive, creative, and life changing worship. So worship describes those times we gather to deliberately together, seeking an encounter with God. Um, Worship provides a time and a place to think less about ourselves and more about faith. Uh, it's less about our personal agendas and more about God's activity and 
well. So if there were ever a time that we needed to have corporate worship, it is definitely now. Um, the recent events, I mean, within our communities, uh, I, it's just very clear um, that churches are needed. And they're also needed to create space for people to just come and mourn, but also to come together and, and share hope. Um, so when we do have people to come to worship with us, we want something that's authentic. Um, generation that I'm a part of uh, has, we, we flew away from the church for a while and then we're steadily coming back now that we're having kids and uh, are becoming the adults that our parents always wanted us to be. And we're realizing how hard life is. Uh, so now we are, you see us popping up at churches. Um, looking for help and looking for guidance. Uh, and, and authentic worship is important because if not, we, we will call it out and say, you know what, this does not feel real. Doesn't have any movement to it. Doesn't feel alive. Uh, creative worship is something that I've seen more done more over the past two years than I have in my entire life. And I'm pretty sure you have as well. As a result of the pandemic, people had to be very creative with how they had corporate worship. Yeah. For me, what we do in worship, it, it matters. It, everything that we do from the beginning to end. I mean, from the time that somebody pulls up on the parking lot, they are, or my my expectation is you are now entering into worship mode, right? You, you didn't come just to see family and friends. Of course, you're going to do that. You're going to have fellowship. But anything that happens from the time that they arrive to the time that they leave can and will influence how we worship, how we express ourselves during service. So God uses our worship to transform lives, heal wounded souls, renew hope, shape decisions, um, provoke change, inspire compassion. I mean, literally anything that can happen on a Sunday when we're in worship can influence the way somebody starts off their week. My prayer every time before I preach and at the end of service is that God, whatever I say or whatever we do, our prayer is that it does not turn somebody away from you. And that is my earnest prayer because somebody is coming there trying to, they're trying to make a critical decision about life and, the, and something can turn them off. Who knows the many people that have walked through the doors of our churches trying to decide whether or not they were going to go home and kill themselves. In fact, I'll tell this story, which is my first, my first assignment. I was a youth and young adult pastor in Northern Virginia, and I had only been there for a week. Uh, and, and in that time, I had grown to, to have a Bible study that first night, and it was packed out. You know, all these young adults had a phenomenal time. But then that Sunday had a great worship service. And then that, that evening, I found out that one of my young adults, man, he, he kills his wife and himself. And, and it, it, it really messed with me. It bothered me. That was my first time experiencing that kind of, of hurt as it, from a pastoral standpoint where I just wondered what could I have done differently to help him? What support was needed? Because those kind of things happen all the time. But we take it for granted our time together because we don't assume that this time, this one hour that we have together, or hour and a half that we have together is, is not as important. No, it is. It is. Somebody's life can literally change in the blink of an eye, just by coming to worship with us. Worship also sends us into the community more consciously aware and spiritually present, uh, excuse me, prepared to represent God's hope and become ambassadors of his grace. That's what you were talking about. Um, uh, Deacon Wright, uh, yeah, Deacon Wright, 
it, it, the Holy Spirit utilizes us and informs us. It, it pushes us and gives us the understanding of what we need to know so that when we go out into the world, we don't misrepresent God. And, and we see that a lot in politics. I mean, there's a lot of misrepresentation of what a Christian is right, <laughs> these days. <laughs> you know? So what we have to do is, is ensure that our worship together is mindful, but it also is socially sensitive. So that when we inform folk to go back into the communities, that they are ready to transform them. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Um, so then, uh, Reverend Artis, what, what causes us to hold our testimony or to shy away from giving a testimony? Uh, I mean, sometimes, you know, it seems like it's so hard to get people to share that because of whatever reasons. What, what are some of the reasons you think people hold on to it instead of sharing? Uh, I can give you a couple of different reasons. So the first thing that I'm thinking of based off of your question, one, people don't have the space for it. There's no space created for them to give a testimony. Okay, Either can you explain that? Hmm? Sure, I can explain that. When I say space, I mean that there is literally no space, whether it be in a room with other people or they have no contact with other that they can formally give their testimony. I gave the example of using the website. That is create that is a space for people to do that. So sometimes they don't have the space to do it. That's an outside issue. That's something that is not necessarily always in their control, right? Another issue that they could be is they might have some pride or they might have some pain. Oftentimes, the testimonies that we have are not always tied to exuberant praise, right? We don't continue to preach about sharing your testimony um, because we believe that everybody has this powerful, impactful testimony that is just so happy. Sometimes our testimonies end with us being alone, being pulled out of situations that we might have wanted to stay in. So it could be that. Uh, a third thing, I think, um, is space. It could, and then, oh, yeah, speak space, pride, or pain, and then it could also be people. They just, there's a, there's a text in the Old Testament that says, uh, don't be afraid of their faces. And oftentimes, the space can be too overwhelming for, for folk. They want to give a testimony, but they probably need the platform or the space of like a, a website so they can do it anonymously. It's not that they don't want to, they just a little shy. Thank uh, you, great, great answer, thank you. You're welcome, sir. Rev, uh, um, one of the reasons why I don't, I'd love mm -hmm. to share right now is because I, first of all, I be thinking, that even though I go through a boatload of stuff, everybody else go through more stuff than I do, and I yield to them to give theirs. Now, maybe just maybe I yield too much because I don't do a lot of testimony, but at the same time, I recognize why I don't, and I, and I wonder if I should just say, forget about everybody else, here's my testimony, and just, mm -hmm. and just do it. But but, I, you know, I be trying to restrain myself because the Lord has been great to me. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't want to take the floor and keep the floor. Does that make sense? It does. It makes perfect sense. Uh, one, let me tell you and, and share with you. Well, let me, excuse me. Let me empower you uh, and remind you that you are worthy of sharing your, your testimony. That, that's the first thing. 
Um, your testimony is no bigger or smaller than anyone else's. It's your personal testimony. Therefore, it is a part of God's grace that's been extended. And you know this and you can share with whoever you would like. Um, if you are ever in that type of setting where you feel the unction to share, I would encourage you to share because you're not just sharing it to get it off your chest or to share it, but you're sharing it also to encourage someone else. Someone else might need to hear what you have to say. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Y'all better look out. <laughs> well, can I, can I just say this? I think that we, um, you know, and sometimes we as leadership feel that we want to give everybody else an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so you don't do that. And I think that's what Dick and Avery is, is speaking of. You know, you don't want to take all the time or be the spotlight, even though you are going through things and you're not ashamed or afraid to testify how good God has been to you. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to be the only one that, that talks for the whole day. And I just don't get an opportunity. So, yeah. you know, but I mean, what do you do if it's all quiet and nobody's saying nothing? I, you know, you got to, you know, you got to step up, you know, because like you said, you, nobody knows your story and mm -hmm. how, what he's done for you. And what he's done for you, he's done for others as well. They may not feel comfortable talking about it, but if you do, then I don't think there's anything wrong with just let it, let it flow. Yeah, yeah. We, we just let it flow. Um, I just remember what I remember earlier, I, I said there's still structure. There's still some type of uh, organization when we do this uh, corporately or, or publicly like this, just so that we're mindful of time, sake, and all of that. However, when, when the Holy Spirit is moving amongst us, we sense it and we know it. And the leadership uh, has the, the right to... Um, extend that time or to say, okay, you know what, we're good for right now. And that's because the leader uh, leadership is, should be the most, if not um, sensitive of the Holy Spirit in that moment. Let's see. I'll, I'll, I'll add on to that as well. Yes, sir. Um, all right. A lot of times when we well, when we give our testimonies, it's not technically for us ourselves. It's actually for those who who may need to hear the word. Because truth be told, uh, sometimes Jesus, the only way folks can see Jesus is through us. How do you know how to tell somebody about a man without you know without explaining what he's done for you? You know, and. And sometimes your testimony could be the one word that folks hear to stick uh, to a situation that they may, may, may be going through in a similar way and find out, hey, this is what the Lord helped me get through. Mm -hmm. And it actually, you know, helps both. You know what I mean? Not only is it helping yourself, but someone, you know, may have a life changing uh, experience by just hearing a word that you never knew. Uh, that would seem common to you, but just saying it may be little to you, but humongous to somebody else out there listening. Yeah. Thank you for that addition, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Let's let's look at this next slide. Um, we got about five more slides we need to get through. All right, so at the beginning, we, we know that people have been coming together for worship, for prayer, uh, listening to God's word um, forever. There, there was just always some type of church, even though it was not called church. The Greek root or the Greek word is ekklesia, um, meaning to call out, um, refers to calling people out of their ordinary life to gather in sacred time and space. So let me ask you these kind of questions. I just want to get some, some feedback on your journey as Jerusalem. What did COVID teach you about joining together for worship? So that's the big question. These are the questions I want you to share. What did you keep? 
What did you do away with? What did you learn about yourselves? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Sure. What, what, a couple of things. One, COVID taught us or taught me um, as far as worship was concerned to look for people who really wanted to bring that energy to worship and not just make somebody stand up because, well, we need somebody to pray, you go pray. You know, if you stand up and you really don't want to be there, I think the, the, the congregation really can tell it. So, so it, it, it came, it, we got really down to the bare bones of what it means to try to approach God. And a lot of the, some of the form and fashion, you know, sort of, you know, went to the side and we began to, to just say, let's come together to, to, to thank God for, for, for all that he's done. And and, you know, in the Baptist church, we have the, you know, the opening selection and somebody talk and then the, the next thing and then somebody talk and then we had a scripture and somebody talk, you know, and, and we just sort of like uh, get our way through our worship. Now it's, it's more of let's come together and let's sing to the glory of God and then let's hear the word of God, you know, and, and I, I love the way that that we're doing it now because it's not so so you know ritualistic. ritualistic. That's that was that's that's the word I wanted. It is, it's it's a lot. It's freer, and we're open. Um, we're open to changes much freer now um, than we were um, pre-COVID. I mean, we'll, we'll we'll switch it up in a heartbeat, you know, based on um, on the movement of the spirit. That's just my. Good. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I think commitment, um, and it, it gave us an opportunity, COVID gave us an opportunity to, to examine ourselves mm -hmm. and to uh, commit or recommit ourselves to worshiping him, regardless of the situation and circumstance. Uh, however, I do feel that there still needs to be structure uh, you know, because not everyone may feel the same way uh, with with rituals and traditions, and you know, some people is more important to them than to the other people. So I think we have to have a balance in any service, so that you know everyone gets fed the Word of God the way that they feel that they should have it, uh, and if, you know. If, we're there to be servants. You know, we're there to encourage one another. And you can't encourage a person if they're not, you know, able to get on board with everything that we may feel what we want to do. I wrote something down while you were just talking, Deacon, right? Um, and, and let me go back. So I've heard intentionality, uh, removal of, of kind of like dead space, um, <clears throat> commitment. Uh, balance. I heard that as well. Uh, one thing you said was self it was examination or, or the commitment level with people. And you had to examine uh, what you were doing prior to and what you're doing now. And I wrote something down that I, I hope you all can receive this. Um, you can't go to the next level without examining yourself first. Amen. And, and I think that that's fitting when we're talking about worship, uh, because worship does not start when you get to church. It starts at home. It starts in your bathroom. It starts when you're in the shower. It starts way when you wake up your eye, when you open your eyes in the morning, you are immediately cognitive or aware of what is going on around you. Therefore, as an act of worship, you say thank you. I also believe that the jury is still out on what COVID has taught or is teaching us yeah. because we, we have um, made physical church secondary 
Hmm. In more. Many, many ways. And and um and the challenge is did we make the Lord secondary in the process? And I'm not equating being in church with worshiping God, because I know you can do it whether you're in church or not in church, but I'm saying the jury is still out on that. We that that hadn't been decided yet. But you'll know you'll know the uh, tree by the fruit that it bears. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you say physical church um, being secondary, but you're not, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm hearing you clearly. You're not saying that coming to, to church on a Sunday is indicative of your relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I hope not, but okay. the jury is still out. The jury is still out. And I'm, and I'm saying that because I teach a Sunday school class that as many times has had as much as 15 people in it. Mm -hmm. Maybe they are still worshiping, but they're not in my Sunday school class. Mm -hmm. And I'm not giving up on them yet. I'm just simply saying the jury is still out. We'll find out. Okay. I agree with you. The jury is definitely out. And in many uh, churches, specifically based off of what you're sharing with me, um, we are still in a in a post COVID. It's almost like an endemic kind of thing. We're, we're, we've just been it, we've had the the bumps and bruises of COVID. We learned what we wanted to learn, or we did. Uh, we learned what we did not want to learn, and now we are in this space where we're we're moving right. Uh, we're moving at our own pace. We move how fast we want to move. Um, and some of our services or acts of worship, um, i.e. a Bible study, a uh, Sunday school class, uh, while they are very important, we found a way to do them in different ways. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm on board with you. I agree. The jury is still out on that. And I think it's going to be out for a while. It gives us more space to be even more creative. All right. Anyone else? Um, what did you do away with? What did you keep? What did you learn about yourself during this time? Um, if I can share with you all, I talked to some friends of mine before. They're, they're non-preachers. <laughs> but in, in talking with them, their families uh, stopped going to church during COVID. And um, they recently just started going back. And he said, you know, I, I didn't realize how important it was to have my, my kids, um, my friends talking about his daughters in service on Sundays because they get the same experience I had when I was growing up. It's like, that's true. And we, we value that now. Uh, but it, it was not something we were as eager to do when we were younger. I saw someone came off the uh, mute. Yeah, Pastor uh, Artis. Mm -hmm. My name is uh, Steve Jeter. And what this COVID taught taught me was that it was it was change. Mm -hmm. um, that we can't put we can't put Christ in a box. Mm. We like you say. Now, now we were uncomfortable. We we were used to doing. Was it just a ritual? Was it was, you come to church, you do this, 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 and that. Now, we had to be still. God was talking to us, and are are we listening? And are are we really submitting to Him? You know, we are we are we really being obedient? You know, just because we're not inside the church, you know. Are you going to stop? Are you going to stop worshiping God? Mm. So he made us uncomfortable. And like Gary said, the jury is still out. Some people stop coming for whatever reason. But did your faith get stronger or, or did your or did your faith wait? Mm -hmm. This is what I got. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I like that. I like uh, that that Christ. I uh, can't be put in a box. Um, and, and if I take uh, preacher liberties, I'll, I'll make up the word boxify. I think that that is a word, but I'll use that in <laughs> in this context. 
um, that God is more vast than we would ever assume or could think. Um, it's it's always interesting to me the the text that says uh, that God will um, will provide for our for our needs. Um, what is it? It says that that God will do exceeding abundantly. There it is. You do exceeding abundantly above all that we ever wish, hope, or think. Um, could it be that 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 is not talk, always talking about the tangible things that we receive, but God has the ability to increase our worship, to increase our our time of sharing with each other? And, and if we would ever just pray for an overwhelming amount of people to be at Bible study or at Sunday school, you know, Lord, give us the creativity that we need or the people and the resources that we need uh, so that we can touch and impact lives in Bible study. Just leave it right there and see what God does. <clears throat> yeah, Pastor, uh, I, I think that the, the jury is still out. And, and here's my reasoning for saying that is mm -hmm. that we have uh, like Bible study, like, before going into COVID, I think Bible study was probably eight to ten people, and now we're like nineteen or more on a Zoom on a Zoom call. Mm -hmm. But Sunday school, which was you know like Avery said, you know every Sunday we had people in Sunday school. Now we have no uh, very minimum in Sunday school who are learning about the Christ. So we have to continue to develop and, 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 and change as things have changed because we, we're not there yet, okay? That, that's, we're just not there yet, okay? Okay. Thank you for your feedback. I think um, what, what, uh, just picking back on what you said and, and um, how it, it interpret how it's shared within this um, is that God can and will do what we we need God to do as long as we are open to trying something different, which I will say you have definitely said that. So all right, let's let's go to the to the next slide. This next slide talks about being a little passionate uh, with worship. Um, who was that that said? And y'all should see my desk right now. I got stickies all over the place. Uh, <laughs> what was it? Okay. Looking for energy from people. How do you, was that your digging time to? Looking for energy from people? Okay. So that, that's an intention. Authentic, authentic worship. You, authentic you want, worship. I don't necessarily, you know, looking for somebody to get up and, and shout and scream, but when I look in your face, I can tell. And a lot of people can tell if you don't want to be there, you know, if yeah. you just stand up there because it's your time and your name's on the program and you got to do it, mm -hmm. you know, versus someone who's who just comes humble and just wants and just pours their heart out. Even if they stumble all over themselves, you can tell, you know, that 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 is where it's coming from. And so that that was my statement. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, worship expresses devotion, honor, love to God. You can tell. When I pick on myself, you can tell um, as a preacher when the preacher has not spent time with God. And that's not saying that they are not called to preach. However, you can tell during the sermonic moment when they have not spent time with God that week. Um, or if it's the Saturday night special sermon, you know, for, for, for whatever it is, we'd have to be intentional of our worship, right? Uh, I shared this. It might have been the first Bible study I did with you all that my my favorite time of the day uh, is waking up and being able to do my devotional. I just, you know, if the weather's nice, I sit out on my patio and I just stare at the, the trees, listen to the little tree, the creek behind me, and, and I'm just talking to, talking to the Lord. Um, and that's how I start my day because I know any and everything is going to happen. Whether I pray it away, wish it away, throw some money in a, in a fish jar or whatever, it's going to happen. But what I can control is my response and my reaction, my disposition to everything that happens. 
So that way I give, I give, I honor and I give God space to flow through me. So that way I ain't caught off guard <laughs> and don't, y'all forgive me, don't cuss nobody out, right? You have those moments and you got to spend time in worship alone by yourself so that you can express it passionately with other people. Passionate worship, worship fosters the yearning to authentically honor God. When was the last time you, you just told God, I honor you? I, I adore you. Before you even ask for, for anything, let, just thank him for everything. And just, just bask in the moment that God is Emmanuel with us. God is with us, you know. Um, we, we, we oftentimes get so bogged down with the weight of, of responsibility with the world, with our families and society. I mean, you turn on the news and, you know, schools are being shot up and it's, you just got to take a moment and just remind yourself of how you authentically love and cherish God. Okay. And that is how you flow into being passionate on Sundays or any worship experience. Now, here's what can happen. Um, is this it? Yeah, the heartbeat of life. And then the, uh, the, the next one is the uh, approaches. Yes. So <clears throat> worshiping God is at the heartbeat of life in our faith communities. Um, look at this one, this bullet right here. Right here where it says, um, always assume visitors are present. You see that? I think to an, a, a degree, most churches, um, and, and I'm not totally sure about Jerusalem, but I know um, based off of Cedar Street's experience during the pandemic, um, the first people who came back to worship were not our members. They were visitors. Did y'all see the same thing? Or see something similar where you saw some faces that were unfamiliar? We did we did get some visitors. Yeah. Um and what we had to really watch out for uh is is our people um um being too cautious about COVID to the extent mm -hmm. that we may or may not have made people feel as welcome as we would under normal circumstances. Yeah, wow. Wow. That's a I've I, you know what, D, I've never heard it put like that. Because that, I didn't think you were going there. I thought, um, I thought you were going away where it would say, you know, our people would influence them in a negative way, like somebody was being nasty to them or saying something out of, you know. But the fact that people were cautious because of COVID, that's something I, I have not seen, and that's that's pretty interesting. But um, I know with with what I experienced at Cedar Street, um, the visitors who came. Uh, they came early on in the pandemic and they never left. It was very interesting. They they found a new home. Uh, uh, most of them actually were not attending another church. They didn't leave one church and come to this one. They, they were at home and then decided, I'm going to start going to church. And because they were unchurched, so to say, <laughs> we had the opportunity to kind of shape and form them and you know they join ministries and they're, they're happy go lucky now but what i'm what i'm trying to point out is that always assume that there are visitors in your midst that they are unfamiliar with what you think of as normal right uh placing special emphasis on services for back to school christmas new year easter we do all of that stuff right um publicizing interesting or provocative themes to draw people into several week periods of renewal study or reflection. Um, I, I, I think that provocative themes are in, important to bring up um, when we have the space and the time to do it. Um, Bible study is, is going to be Bible study where we have a book or a type of 
uh, scripture or text that we're looking at. Uh, but then we also have opportunities to do experiences where you just have a conversation about social justice or how we can impart this um, or how we can be influential into that area when it comes to school um, school violence or school uh, needs in a, in a sense. Um, but, but publicizing this helps us to attract people um, so that they will come to worship as well. All right, let me do these two approaches because I see my time is running short. All right, so two approaches. Deepening the worship life of our church <clears throat> involves interweaving two approaches into the planning at once, enhancing the quality of exist existing services and multiplying the opportunities and settings for worship. Enhancing the quality of the existing services and then multiplying the opportunities and settings for worship. So look at what you currently have. See the areas of growth. It's almost like doing a SWOT analysis. For those who, who, who's, uh, who have done business or administration or anything, you ever done a SWOT analysis, it's literally like doing a SWOT analysis. Our strengths, our threats, our, I, I don't really care for the word weaknesses, but limitations and then opportunities of growth. All right. Um, and then multiplying opportunities and settings for worship. So instead of saying, okay, we're going to meet on Sunday. Okay. We don't have Sunday. Then we got Bible study on Wednesday. What else can we do? Do we need to do anything in this season? Maybe the season doesn't call for additional services. The people are tired. Okay. They all on vacation. Let's do it. But we know while we're on vacation, while we're waiting for the fall, we're planning during the summer so that we know by the time the fall comes, we're ready to go. All right. So in increasing those opportunities and settings for worship gives people the opera gives them the advantage of being in fellowship together more often. And it, that helps because we have uh, varying schedules even now. Like my daughter, uh, she does competition cheerleading. So some weekends she is gone for two, three days. Um, she does more traveling than I do right now. Um, it, but we have to still find a vein or find some type of connection for youth and young adults, right? I checked out the uh, church Facebook page and I saw that the kids went to uh, an event. What was it? Maybe about a week or two ago. That's phenomenal. That's awesome. You have to keep that consistency so that they will have something to look forward to. And then we also know live stream services. Live streaming a service can be great, but it can also be a headache. It can cause all type of anxiety um, because as the one who is um, who's doing the streaming, you want it to be perfect, right? Um, you want to broadcast what your church uh, is doing, um, and, and you want to do it in an authentic way. So, so one of the Zoom users said, amen, <laughs> amen. All right, let's, let's round this out. All right, imagine your new worship. John 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. And later on in the, the Apostle Paul talks of us as a body with, with many parts. Um, we each have a role. We each have a, a lane that we work or serve in. And it is not up to the pastor. It's not up to just the leadership. It is entire the entire ecclesia, the body of Christ, to ensure that worship is exuberant, right? You can't come in, as, as one of our leaders said, you can't come in and just expect to get a show. The football game is only as exciting as you make it. In fact, if you've been to an NFL game, you know that the commentators that you hear on TV are not in, this, in the actual uh, arena. You got to make the experience better. All right. Imagine the motivation for enhancing the quality of worship 
and multiplying the opportunities for worship. Um, it, it's allowing God to use us and our congregations to offer a more abundant life for all. That's the overall goal of worship in 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 this new day and age. Now I, I closed out my screen um, just to get some comments or, or questions. But that is our, our position, to have passionate worship. Um, it's, it's to make God shine. It's to make God happy. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I used to think, you know, why does God want all of this honor, glory? And, and then I had to live life and, and understand that it's not that God wants it, but God deserves it. So therefore, every opportunity that I have, um, I will give that unto God, what he is rightfully due. Um, because when I think hmm, of the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me, uh, my soul has to just follow my head and my mind and just express how much I am utterly in awe with God. Are there any questions? There are no questions. Okay, I have I have one question. When yes. when when you talked about um, intentionality in worship, how would you approach, say, a church um, um, as its pastor um, when it came to the idea of worship and what your expectation is? Mm -hmm. So my expectation of worship. Yes. And how, how involved would you be in that process? Uh, very involved. Um, I believe that the pastor is the lead worshiper. Um, that pastor may not be up there the whole time singing and leading the folk, but empowers others to lead worship. Um, but also helps with the logistics of worship. Um, and when, when we say logistics of worship, uh, for those who are not aware, we're talking about anything that happens from, from the parking lot to the, to the door. Um, you, you want to have a robust group of volunteers that help with, with parking lot, with parking. Um, you want somebody that, that is knowledgeable of hospitality that does greeting and, and can welcome people in. Um, those, those kind of things enhance the worship experience because you want to have um, people feel welcome before they even sit down in the pew. Um, so my involvement would be, would be very um, heavy, uh, but I also believe that it's a partnership between the pastor um, and, and the musicians and singers and anyone who is participating in the worship experience, um, those who are leading in song, um, they should definitely make contact with the pastor or vice versa throughout the week and, and discuss like, hey, this is what we're singing. Okay, this is what we're singing. This is the text that I'm looking at going at um, so that it can marry together and that it's clear to the congregation that this is our push that we're looking at. This is the theme that we're looking at. So say we're talking about prayer. Um, you, you don't want to sing a song that's a funeral dirge <laughs> when we're talking about prayer <laughs> for the week or, or what have you. You want something that supports that and vice versa. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that my my role as as pastor would be that or to to enhance the worship lead the worship you're the main you're the chief leader of worship but you're not the uh, you're not the the showman you empower and you lead others and give space for them to to share their gifts and their call as well Whoever Zoom you user is, I, you are hilarious. There's a, there's a whole lot of amen. Thank you. 
All right, any other questions? Mm. Wonderful. Well, that completes our Bible study for tonight. All right. We thank Reverend Artis for empowering us and to focus on worship and giving us some spiritual discernment. We thank you. And so we are going to um, let him close out in his own way. All right. Okay. Thank you, Dignus Parker. So for those um, who this is your first time at Bible study with me, um, I pray that uh, that you were you were understanding. I, I, sometimes I can I can talk a little fast, um, but I hope that you took notes in the areas that you did. Um, and, and I'm just praying that you all have a great remainder of the week. Uh, it's still Holy Week. It's, it's the Super Bowl for the church. Make sure you get to somebody's church either on Thursday or Friday. Um, look, somebody told me on Sunday, they said, Rev, I don't, I don't know, but we might uh, come to, to service on Friday night at Cedar Street. Um, we have a good Friday service with uh, all women, um, Seven Last Sands. So, if you come out there, please, please come see me, shake my hand so I can um, so I can see who you are. But thank you all so much for the opportunity again to just share with you this evening. OK, let's pray again. Father, we thank you for what has been shared in this time. We thank you, Lord God, that we who are like minded in in our faith are called together and to come together as a body to just study and to show ourselves approved. We thank you, God, for each person who is on this call. And I thank you, oh Lord, that they counted it a blessing and not robbery from their time or their family to just spend with their church family just to just study and just to discuss and to bounce ideas off of each other. We know, Lord God, that we are better for having been together and that you delight in our learning. So Lord God, take this time and remind us as we go into these next few days of what we are called to do, and that is to be the body of Christ. And now, Lord God, as we leave from this space, we ask that you would give us a good night's rest and allow us, Lord God, to be uh, your, 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 your grace recipients tomorrow morning, waking up our eyes and realizing how good you've been to us another day. Give us our benedict. This is our prayer for us in the mighty name of Jesus that we do pray and ask it all. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the lesson. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Have a blessed night. <laughs> all right.